The topic of this presentation is benign breast disorders. So benign in the sense that they're not cancerous. Benign breast disorders encompass a heterogeneous group of conditions. This can include masses, cysts, abnormalities seen on imaging, nipple discharge, breast pain, inflammatory breast disease, and different, different skin disorders. It's quite a lengthy topic if you want to review Practice Bulletin 164. However, the objectives to this presentation are to simplify. So our first objective are to list the categories of benign breast lesions in masses so that we can develop a framework. Review the clinical presentations of common breast lesions within each of those categories. Briefly review diagnostic imaging of a palpable breast mass, and briefly review nostalgia classification and treatment, as this is something that I don't think it, we commonly address, but I had a couple of questions on. The classification of most benign breast lesions falls within one of three categories, non-proliferative, proliferative without atypia, and atypical hyperplasia. There's a few other benign breast lesions that includes tubular adenomas and phylloides tumors that we'll talk about briefly as well. Non-proliferative breast disorders. Simple breast cysts are the most common type of non-proliferative breast lesion and can be found in up to one third of women ages 35 to 50. They can vary in size, but are almost always benign fluid filled masses. They can be microscopic to clinically palpable. They're usually discrete, compressible, and a blotted laudable solitary mass in your question vignette. You should also think about galactoseals if the clinical vignette discuss a pregnancy or a postpartum patient. Um, this is a milk retention cyst common in women who are breastfeeding. Fat necrosis, it's not something listed under the table in the practice bulletin, but is also a breast benign breast finding. It can develop after blunt trauma to the breast or surgery such as breast reconstruction or radiation therapy. You'll notice different, different palpable changes in the breast. You may also see this with skin ecchymoses. A breast abscess, again, not necessarily benign in the sense that it can't cause harm, but not cancerous. It's a localized collection of inflammatory exudate that can develop alongside mastitis or cellulitis. And you'll usually will have all the other signs of infection as well. So thinking about the rep, the, the warmth, the redness, tenderness, but it may also be a discrete mass. Diabetic mastopathy was something that I wasn't familiar with, but may be seen in a woman with long-standing type 1 diabetes who has suspicious fibrous breast lumps that are usually multiple. And this would be something that you need to diagnose or biopsy for diagnosis. Lastly, idiopathic granulomatous mastitis is a rare inflammatory disease of the breast. It usually presents as painful, firm, and ill-defined mass that can have erythema and edema of the skin. Again, not something listed in the practice bulletin, but also something that it would be a non-proliferative breast mass. The next category is proliferative without atypia. The most common I think question stem or even the most common cause of breast mass in adolescent girls and young women that you may see are fibroadenomas. These are going to account for half of all of breast biopsies. They can also present in older women, accounting for 12% of all masses in menopausal women. These are glandular and fibrous tissue. They're presenting as a well-defined mobile mass on exam and again are benign. A typical adenoma is fibroadenoma is small, one to two centimeters, but there can also be things such as that are called giant fibroadenomas that are greater than 10 centimeters, but that's gonna be an extraordinarily unusual variant of juvenile or adult fibroadenomas and only account for about 4% of all. Scler sclerosing adenosis is a lobular lesion with increasing fibrous tissue. There's no need to treat this. Um, they are considered proliferative lesions without atypia, but are only associated with a very small to moderate increased risk of future develop of breast cancer to be notable. A radial scar is a pseudoproliferative lesion and are usually incidental findings on biopsies. There are compl complex sclerosing lesions. Um, excision is recommended for this as there sometimes can be, they can sometimes harbor or develop um, atypical proliferations, but no other treatment is needed. Introductal papillomas. This is going to be our typical clinical vignette um, with the patient with bloody nipple discharge. It's the most common cause of that. It's a tumor in the lactiferous duct. 
Um, they can be solitary and centrally located or multiple and peripherally located, so may not give too much of a clue when you're reading the question. And most significantly, these most commonly occur in ages women ages 50 or excuse me 30 to 50 years old and are typically small but can present as a palpable mass up to five centimeters in size. What's important is that they can harbor ductal carcinoma in situ. They've been, that has been diagnosed within solitary papillomas, but they're not usually associated with cancer. If bothersome or concerned for atypia, tipia, surgical excision is performed. If we were to get a slide of an introduct introductal papilloma, this is what it would look like. It's a monotonous array of papillary cells that grow from the wall of a cyst into the lumen. Occasionally, Kriog throws one of these at us. Atypical hyperplasia includes atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Atypical ductal hyperplasia is a proliferation of uniform epithelial cells with round nuclei that fill part of the duct. Standard of care after a biopsy proven diagnosis is surgical excision due to the risk of upgrade to ductal carcinoma. And for lobular hyperplasia, this is monomorphic, evenly spliced dehesive cells that fill part of the lobule um, versus the duct. But they can also involve the duct, which is somewhat confusing. Referral to a breast oncologist should incur as management varies based on other clinical risk factors. And in the other category are tubular adenomas that I haven't ever I haven't seen on a question stem, but they are benign glandular cells. They have minimal stromal elements. They may be seen as a breast mass or on routine breast imaging. Uh, lactating adenomas can be seen during pregnancy or postpartum, and they would present as a palpable mass and would need biopsy for diagnosis of the benign lesion. Phylloides tumors, I think, is the most uncommon fibroepithelial tumor that we'll commonly see on, see on questions. It's only 0.3 to 0.5% of all cases of breast tumors. The median age at presentation is 40 years old with the usual presentation of a single enlarging breast mass. They have the same characteristics of fibroadenoma. So on palpation, they're firm, circumscribed, and mobile, but they have rapid growth, which I think is going to be the key in the clinical vignette. Only about 5% of all cases of phylloides tumors will develop a propensity for local recurrence to a sarcoma capable of producing distance mets, which is why they are more important um, to characterize whether it's benign or abnormal. For lobular carcinoma in situ, it's a histologic finding that does not usually present as a mass, um, but is usually diagnosed as an incidental finding on a breast biopsy for some other lesion. And unlike DCIS, LCIS is not considered a precursor lesion for breast cancer, but rather it's a risk marker for future development of breast cancer. Women who are diagnosed with LCIS have an estimated 10 to 20% risk of developing invasive ductal or invasive lobular cancer in the following 15 years. For diagnostic imaging, this is quite a lengthy topic in itself. Um, just to review briefly, BIRADS is the breast imaging reporting and data system, and it goes from category zero up to category six. Category zero is incomplete, category one is negative, category two benign, three is probably benign, four is suspicious, five is highly suggestive of malignancy, and six is known biopsy proven malignancy. There are two useful tables, figure one and figure two within the practice bulletin. Goes, under, goes over the management of a palpable mass in women younger than 30 years old but and over 30 years old. And for younger than 30 years old, it depends on your clinical suspicion. If you have a very low clinical suspicion for a cancerous mass, you can actually observe for one to two menstrual cycles. And if the mass resolves, you do routine follow-up screening. But if the mass persists, you go to ultrasound. And again, for a palpable mass less than 30 years old, ultrasonography is the primary means. And after ultrasonography, it depends on the BIRADS. So if it's solid, it whether it's classified as BIRADS 3, 4, or 5, depends on what type of tissue biopsy or further examination. But I think that's too much information to go in through this um, 
presentation. For a pa papal breast mass for someone greater than 30 years old, diagnostic mammography is the gold standard and you don't observe. And then after getting the diagnostic mammo, based on the BIRADS classification, if it's one to three, you go to ultrasonography versus four to five, you go immediately to tissue biopsy. In clinical practice, ultrasonography happens most of the time alongside the diagnostic mammo, which is something to consider when writing uh, prescriptions for a diagnostic mammo um, when you have a suspicion for a clinical mass. A question. A 45-year-old woman presents for her annual Wellman visit. She is concerned because she has a large quarter-sized lump in her left breast that she reports has grown significantly over the past six months. On clinical exam, the mass is firm, circumscribed, and mobile. There is also noticeable stretching of the overlying skin. Breast imaging shows a solid mass. What is the next best step? And I hope you chose excisional biopsy. This question is characteristic of a phalloides tumor. Again, they typically behave in benign manners like fibroadenoma, so the firm circumscribed mobile mass. But what is significant here is that it's grown significantly over six months and there's notice noticeable stretching of the overlying skin. So an excisional biopsy as compared to a core needle biopsy, which may be help diagnose a fibroadenoma is important. This was a question that I got on TrueLearn that actually I believe has the incorrect answer that I should submit to TrueLearn. So this is in regards to what, how can you best treat nostalgia using danazole, which is an androgen for severe nostalgia. The correct, the incorrect correct answer that TrueLearn listed was that dietary changes like low fat, high complex carbohydrate diet may be effective when on page 10 of the practice bulletin, it specifically says, and also relates to number three, that elimination of caffeine or these low fat low or high complex carbohydrate diets are not conclusively demonstrated to reduce nostalgia. Number four, tamoxifen is considered a first line treatment of nostalgia. That's not correct. It can be utilized for severe refractory cases of nostalgia. And then vitamin E, I didn't come across anything. So that one is null. But just briefly about nostalgia, it can be classified into three different categories. Cyclical or related to hormonal changes. Cyclical nostalgia with a normal physical exam generally doesn't require any other workup and reassurance can be appropriate in this management. Non-cyclical may indicate a breast etiology, um, of course not varied by the menstrual cycle, so less like mastitis, cysts, tumors. Cancer very rarely... Um, presents with nostalgia with no other clinical findings. So doing a breast exam, and then you can look at up to date about when to refer someone with nostalgia um, for what type of diagnostic imaging. And then extra mammary problems um, may present with breast pain, but uh, not our breast and etiology. So how is nostalgia managed? Again, um, reassurance may be most appropriate with cyclic nostalgia in a normal exam. Non-pharmacologic treatment is generally first line so well-fitted and supportive braziers using um, pharmacologic treatment with NSAIDs or acetaminophen. Initiation of OCPs is not a proven treatment for nostalgia, but if somebody is getting nostalgia and is taking um, OCPs, they can use a more continuous dosage to improve their symptoms. And then in back to related to the question um, about Danazole, it is an androgen. It is the only medication that is actually approved by the FDA, but it's no longer approved since 2018 for fibrocystic disease. So I think the question is a little bit confusing. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator and has been demonstrated to reduce breast pain um, in people with cyclic pain. But given the adverse effects of Danazole and tamoxifen, their use is really limited and are pretty much limited to severe and refractory cases. I hope that helps in your CREOG review of benign breast disorders.